Hello, everyone, and welcome to this podcast introduction to this week's program with David Horton, my friend from Radford University in the western part of Virginia. I've been there a number of times. He's a close friend of mine. We've done programs together at his campus uh, and now on both the Jefferson Hour and today, uh, Listening to America. He's a terrific guy, interested in robotics and artificial intelligence, but he's also a, a, a university innovator. And today we talked about Jefferson's formation, especially the role of his father. Jefferson is born in Virginia in April of 1743. Why does he become Thomas Jefferson and not Patrick Henry? Why does he become Thomas Jefferson and not somebody you've never heard about who just had a successful uh, plantation? Why does he become a major figure in the history of American civilization, in the history of world culture? Uh, Why does he become a figure of the Enlightenment? And so, you know, these are mysteries, uh, there are mysteries about anyone's formation. If think of your own. How did you become the person that you are? What were the moments? What, what, why aren't you typical person from your zip code? What transformed you or what moved the trajectory of your formation from what it might otherwise have been to what it is? I think the answer to this is largely mentors, more than family. My family had an influence on me, of course. Uh, particularly my father, who was a a cerebral, uh, hard-reading, extremely witty alcoholic. If I hadn't had that father, and I'd had a typical North Dakota farmer in the 1970s, I would be a very different person, not necessarily a better or a worse one, just a different one. And I think for most of us that's the case. But then my mentors, a, a gifted journalist when I was still in high school, Professor Thomas Clayton at the University of Minnesota, uh, the director of the North Dakota Humanities Council, Everett Albers, all these these three people in particular had a greater influence on my life than my parents, partly because my family life was, was disruptive uh, between the ages of nine and, say, 19. But still, I think this is true for most of us. And so this has you know huge implications for the future of higher education. What is it we want to produce with higher education in the 21st century? I know some young people who can work their way around a smartphone the way a a concert pianist works her way around a grand piano. I don't have those skills. I'm still bumbling, you know. Uh, It's it's a slightly alien world to me. I can do some of it, but it's essentially another language for me that I have not fully mastered, and it shows in my life. So these young people are going to be savvy. They're going to be well-connected. They're going to know how to find stuff. They're going to, you know, they're going to book their flights online, they're going to pay their taxes online, they're going to date online, they're going to educate themselves online, uh, they're going to communicate online, uh, and this is just the beginning, and we're really in the in the first phase of the great digital revolution and the communications revolution of the 20th and 21st centuries. So it'll be fascinating to watch. I won't be around for some of it, unfortunately. But my daughter will, and and, I'm certain that she'll take it very, very seriously. She's had gifted mentors that have changed the course of her life. I think not quite to the extent that happened in mine, uh, but, you know, it's too too soon probably to know. David Horton suggested this conversation about formation. Um, Thomas Jefferson's father died when he was 14. Thomas Jefferson's relations with his mother are sort of shadowy, not necessarily negative, but shadowy. Uh, Clearly, it was his father who was the key figure then. And then he had this mentor at the College of William and Mary named William Small, played a more important role than anybody except Jefferson's father, and maybe more than Jefferson's father. So we talked about all that. We talked about the functions of higher education, which in Jefferson's time uh, was not for everybody. You know, in the the 1960s particularly, we exploded higher ed and we decided that everyone um, not only should have access to higher ed if they wanted, but we also made it a, a cultural norm that everyone should, if possible, have some higher, some post K through 12 education. I think that's changing now. Uh, we're, we've sort of seen that experiment through, and a lot of people are saying maybe that was not necessarily the best model for education in the United States. I disagree. Uh, I think that uh, we're we're fortunate in that we have people that pass through a a four-year college or university uh, curriculum and that it needs to include the humanities. It needs to have a liberal arts um, coefficient. 
that it can't just be workforce training, and that we want education to transform us. And I think what was most interesting and what was most moving in the conversation today came from David, who talked about these young people who turn up at Radford or other institutions, it could be Yale for that matter, and they're uncertain and they are sort of carry they're sort of carrying their parents' political, economic, social, and intellectual baggage, religious baggage, which is not necessarily a bad thing. When they get there, they're not they're not finished, and they don't really know who they are yet. And then the question becomes, how does the university uh, experience uh, transform them from that unfinished being into a more finished being? That's number one. Number two, how can it Make sure that it inculcates in young people the desire for lifelong learning, that when you get your degree, you're not done reading great books. I think most young people are forced to read the Iliad at some point or forced to read Hamlet or King Lear, and when they graduate from college, there's a kind of shutting of that door and locking of the key. I think that that's a mistake. I think that what we want are people that will continue to be exploring the great works, great art, great music, great ideas, great religious doctrine, uh, great literature uh, for the rest of their lives. That, that you know, we need to create curious, lifelong learners with the tools that they need to stay current and to have an active soul life, not just an active uh, economic life. Uh, that may sound elitist. I hope it doesn't. I don't think it's elitist. I think it's important. I think that w- we should not turn away from all of that. And so Jefferson is, uh, I, in, in many respects, a black swan. Uh, when I tell young people he read between 12 and 15 hours a day, they just they guffaw or they just shake their heads or roll their eyes because the idea of that just seems 100% alien to them. And if you look at the stats, you know, young people are spending several hours a day playing video games and several hours a day checking Facebook or Instagram and several hours per day uh, binge-watching uh, television series probably on their devices uh, or communicating in instant messages, uh, etc. And when, of course, when you're doing that, you're not reading um, Twelfth Night or Macbeth or Othello. You're not listening to Str- Stravinsky or Beethoven or Bach. And so I think we've we've given up on culture with a capital C. Uh, we've decided that it was pretentious and elitist and racist or Eurocentric. Of course, it's all of those things at times. Uh, but that's no reason to turn away entirely. And so I think we're at a we're in a state of great confusion about what education is. That uncertainty is killing us. I think that if we had a reasonably well educated American public, by which I mean K through twelve, with an understanding of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and what a republic is, that we would not have been in the sort of national slow motion collapse that we're in, that this is a result of the failure of the most important thing that a civilization does, which is that it hands on a set of values and a set of texts, let's call them, that the next generation needs to come to terms with. That's not necessarily Dante's Inferno or Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, although they do have an important place in that story. But it is more than just learning a few skills and being able to do a PowerPoint project as your senior project. We have to restore the idea that there are, I suppose this is the spinach argument, that there are great works of civilization that are not easy to come to terms with, that take discipline, that take persistence, they take gumption but that they pay off and that and that it's essential to a civilization that it, that, that torch that it passes not just be the, the credit card that gets you into Costco. The torch that we're passing has to include an understanding of what civilization is and how fragile it is and, and what's at stake and why it needs to be carefully curated and perpetuated over time. I feel so strongly about that. So... You know, Radford is an institution that's doing some great work. And what I like about it is that it's not stodgy. David and others are trying to make sure that it survives the 21st century. I think institutions like Yale and Stanford and Bryn Mawr and Harvard and UVA will survive because of their prestige, that that's enough to carry them through whatever is happening. They could become irrelevant in a certain sense, except in terms of social elites 
but they will survive. But an average institution, and by average I don't necessarily mean anything negative, but like Radford or like the University of South Dakota or like North Arkansas State, uh, those average institutions are going to have to rethink and reinvent themselves to stay viable as we move into a much more electronified world of education and communication. And so those innovations at places like Radford are essential because if they don't wrestle with these things, they will die. Uh, the, the, the trends are really, uh, and the demographics are really devastating to look at. So I like this quality in my friend David Horton a great deal. He's going to be doing some guest hosting on the Thomas Jefferson Hour. In fact, we're going to do another program tomorrow on sort of the correspondence we've been getting from uh, listeners around the country. We're collecting it in a new way and trying to make sure that we respond to it more fully than we have in the past. So that's another innovation of listening to America. And of course, I'm going on the road next year. My road life begins probably on tax day, April 15th of 2024. I'm going to be wandering this country for the next decade, trying to make sense of it, asking a lot of questions, listening. And the question I'm going to ask is, what is America? What do we signify? What is our role? What is not present? What do we still need to do? Where, where do we want to put the Archimedean lever to, to rebuild this country? How can we become a country of great uh, international stature for its enlightened ways again? How can we rise to our best self? Because we all know that there has been, at least in the ideals of America, a concept of our best self. And just to retreat into Walmart and Costco and binge-watching television uh, is not enough. It's not enough for a nation to be a nation of consumers who look on government with a jaundiced eye, except insofar as it can deliver goods and prosperity. That's not a country. Now, it seems a little crude and clunky to think of John Kennedy's ask not what your country can do for you, but what you, you can do for your country. That seems very 1960, and it probably seemed a little 1960 then, too. So that's not what I'm saying, but I do think we need to have some deeper connect to our nation, to our, to our civilization, than just happening to live in it and to shop in it and to entertain ourselves in it. It's got to be more than that. And so what is the more than that. That's what I want to know. I want to ask people how they how they think about America as we approach the 250th birthday of the United States on July 4th, 2026. So this was fun, interesting, I think important co uh, conversation with my friend David Horton, an administrator at Radford University in Western Virginia. Let's go to the show. Good day, friends, and welcome to Listening to America with Clay Jenkinson. I'm David Horton. I have the distinct honor as serving as guest host today, and we have a very special edition of Listening to America where we're going to have a conversation with Thomas Jefferson. Mr. President, welcome. We are so glad to have you with us today. Good day to you, citizen. So one of the things that I have always wondered about in all of my years of learning about you, Mr. President, and listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour over the years was what your life might have been like had you not pursued national and international service and had that not been the job of the day with that. Um, I'm curious to know a little bit about your family history and to talk about how the influence of your father in particular and your parents might have resulted in different career paths had you not been the author of the Declaration and a Founding Father. Would you mind sharing just a little bit with us about your family history and about your father in particular and what paths you might have discovered? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you. Let me say, first of all, I don't think I really can be said to have pursued a national and international career. I was called to public service by the exigencies of the times. I was called upon to serve in the House of Delegates in my own Virginia. I was called to the Second Continental Congress as an alternate uh, member. And then I was asked to write the Declaration of Independence and things began to you know, have their own momentum thereafter. I had a chance to go to Europe much earlier in my life and turned it down because of my wife's fragile health. I always saw my happiness at Monticello as a planter 
and as a man of letters and a scientist. I did not expect to have a public life, and I was never really fully suited for a public life. So with that caveat, uh, let me say that uh, when I conceived of my life, sir, I thought I might become a published author or certainly contribute to the transactions of the American Philosophical Society and other learned organizations around the country and perhaps in Europe. I might have been a justice of the peace in Albemarle County. It's possible I would have been a delegate to the first House of Burgesses and later House of Delegates, and it's it's even possible that at some point I might have served as governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, so those are the things that w- one might expect. I, my father was a self-made man, essentially. He was a, an exemplar of the overseer class, one of the first settlers in the western hills of Virginia. He was a surveyor and a map maker and himself a justice of the peace. And that's sort of the template that I thought my life might follow. With that in mind, uh, as I was reviewing some of your biography and thinking through this a little bit, the Jeffersonian life, uh, there is the agrarian life that yes. you you speak of so eloquently, but um, so much of what I see in the rearing that you were provided, while your father's education hadn't been as strong, and certainly he was a self-made man having learned to become a surveyor and so many other things, your education was immaculate in many ways and provided you opportunity for books and music and many of the finest things in life. Many times a simple farmer a simple gentleman living in a, in the countryside does not have that opportunity to seek the knowledge of the world and, and the things that the world has to offer. So I'd like to explore, was that truly a path, Mr. President, that you think you might have been able to pursue happily with your love of literature and, and fine wine and, and food from around the not only the Commonwealth, but around the world. If you could speak to that just a little bit. Yes, thank you. So, first of all, I think I would have been content with that. I was always an uneasy public figure. I'm a very shy man. I don't like the give and take, the the tussle of political life, the clash of ambitious men uh, debating societies and you know people whose self-love and self-regard get in the way of good public policy. So I wasn't really suited for the life of a democracy and suffered pretty seriously from the aggressiveness of that world and always looked to Monticello as a haven that I longed to get back to. That's the first thing. Secondly, the agrarian idea. You know, I, I think in your time it's less potent, but it was very potent in my time. And keep in mind that 97% of the American people were farmers in my day. So we were all self-sufficient farmers, essentially. I probably was less self-sufficient than most because I was growing tobacco for export. But the agrarian ideal goes back to Homer in the ancient world and to Horace in the Roman world. Uh, That's why I said in Notes on Virginia, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. And I had a kind of Horatian concept of the farmer who works moderately hard in his fields, but at night sits around the fire with the best wine that he can locally obtain, having conversations with his amiable spouse, learning perhaps Greek and Latin, um, and so on, having some some public role, but a very small one, and, and constantly retreating back to that farm, in Horace's case, a Sabine farm in the hills well away from Rome. That was the ideal, and it was a literary ideal, I will admit, what you're, in your time you might call a trope, and it didn't bear out in strict realistic economics very well, but it still was what captivated me all of my life. So to answer your question directly, I wrote a letter about my closest friend, Dabney Carr. Uh, We were inseparable. We attended school together. These were private schools um, that were held by clergymen in in, in our neighborhood. And he and I used to go up to the little mountain that I later called Monticello, and we would unhitch our, take the saddles off our horses and lie on the ground and talk and dream and uh, think about our lives, and and we made a pact that whoever died first would be buried there, 
and then the second person eventually would be buried there too, which, which in fact um, occurred. He married my sister, and I wrote a letter saying, here is this man of great gifts, married to an amiable woman, living in a modest house with the, some small amounts of basic furniture, eating bacon, and he seems like the happiest man on earth. And I thought, that's a path. That is a path I might have taken. I might have chosen a modest life. I might not have built a domed house. I might not have built a second home at Poplar Forest. I might not have bought the best wines in the world. I might not have had one of the great collections of musical uh, instruments and, and, and musical scores in in the country. I, I, I might not have collected a library of 7,000 volumes, which became the seedbed of the Library of Congress. I, I might have lived that quieter life. And frankly, sir, had I lived within my economic means, I would have had to lead that life. I never had the, the, the wealth to live the life that I actually led. I lived on borrowed funds and wild speculation about better prices and better crops all of my life. When I think of my friend Dabney, who died, unfortunately, uh, as a very young man, just as he was beginning to take a role in, in the state of Virginia as a public role, I think of alternative paths. But the fact is, for some reason or other, I could not see that as my destiny. My destiny is the one you know about, the man on the $2 bill, the man on the nickel, the the, the founder of the Library of Congress. And Mr. President, I think that's a brilliant assessment. As I was looking at a lot of the um, descriptions of how you met your beloved wife mm. uh, and and the things that you had in, in common with her, music and literature and a love of the world seemed to be the binding elements that brought the two of you together. And it, it felt like very much the stars had aligned for you to to find each other. But again, I'll go back to the gentleman farmer versus the scholar and the world bon vivant, for may, maybe lack of a better term, maybe that's not the appropriate term. Would that have relationship have, have turned out in the same way without that, that common interest and passion? I, I'm curious as to your thoughts on that and the reflections you might have had, because it's fascinating to me to think of the Mr. Jefferson that you had in your mind and the President Jefferson, the founder of the University of Virginia, the author of so many important elements of the United States of America, as almost two divergent paths, even though there are commonalities in them. Could you could you speak to that a little bit? C certainly. So I was married for 10 years. Uh, my wife, Martha Wales Skelton Jefferson, was a widow when I got to know her. She had a child who, who unfortunately died soon thereafter. She was beautiful. She was musical. She was a great conversationalist. She had a love of literature. We shared a love of literature. She had what I call that softness of disposition, which is the ornament of her sex and the charm of mine. But she was a frail woman physically, and her repeated pregnancies over that 10-year period wore her down until, unfortunately, she died on the sixth day of September, 1782, at the age of 33. Had she not died, I doubt that I would have been the president of the United States because I had to make a choice. Either I had to attend to my family at Monticello or I could attend to my public life, which would take me away to Philadelphia, to Boston, to New York, maybe to Europe. And she did not travel well. Her health was not such that she could really make those journeys. I can't really imagine her living in the White House. I suppose we could have gotten her there, but she probably wouldn't have been able to travel back and forth. And, and, and I don't think that I would have had the will to serve the public in the ways that are required of someone at that level of prominence because I would have been so concerned about her. So in a sense, her death in 1782 liberated me as a public figure. I use that term with great hesitation because I don't feel liberated. I would give anything to turn the events the other way and live, live a perfectly quiet and private life at Monticello with a, with a, a family and my orchards and my gardens and my books and scientific instruments and music, that would be a much happier life than the one that I led. And there was a hole in my heart from September, from September 6, 1782 until my death in 1826 that was never, I know there are rumors of other liaisons and so on, but it was, that hole was never filled. 
is very clear she was definitely the love of your life, and it was almost destiny that the two of you would meet and and come together. Uh, Mr. President, we need to take a small pause here in just a moment, but uh, I would like to continue down this path of discovering some of the things that you might have done as an author and regarding education when we return if you would be so kind as to share those thoughts with us. Friends, you're listening to Listening to America with Clay Jenkinson. Welcome back to Listening to America with Clay Jenkinson. I'm David Horton, and I have the honor of serving as guest host for this edition, where we are having a wonderful conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. President, thank you so much for being with us once again today. Of course. I won't say that it's a pleasure to talk about my private life, but I'm willing to do it. I think it's incredibly enlightening for those of us who have observed the things that you did centuries ago at our time, but also to understand who you are as a person. I think that's really crucial, and we're so thankful for your willingness to uh, share these very confidential moments of your life. We've been talking, unfortunately, about the passing of your incredible wife, Martha, and and how that impacted you. Liberated was a, a word you reluctantly used, but I might say perhaps motivated also helped to provide a pathway for you to serve the public at a greater level. But I'd like to, and I would like to come back to that, but I'd like to shift the focus a little bit and talk about your relationship with your father. And I know that there were um, limited opportunities for us to know about that. And unfortunately, your father passed when you were quite young. But um, Peter Jefferson was a fascinating individual. You touched on it briefly, stating that he was definitely a self-made man. And from all accounts, that's what I've observed. Even though he did not have many opportunities early in his life, he made the most of what he had. Could you speak a little bit about your perceptions of your father and the influences you felt? He was a hero to me. Unfortunately, he died when I was 14 years old, and I had not had enough time with him because even during those 14 years, I was frequently at day schools or schools where I would be gone for the week. He was often gone. He played an important part in the cartography of Virginia, and he, with a man named um, Joshua Fry of the college, determined the boundary between North Carolina and Virginia and produced the first adequate map of Virginia. So he was extraordinary. He was an explorer. You know, maybe the Lewis and Clark expedition is born in my father's own journeys into the western parts of Virginia, which were a howling wilderness at the time. He was an enormously strong man. He could lift giant kegs of of tobacco, uh, could pull apart a wagon. He could pull a wagon. Uh, So he had kind of a manly physical strength that, that you want in a frontier society. He was a man of great integrity. He was called upon, not only as a cartographer, but uh, to uh, engage in other diplomatic uh, events in in Western Virginia. He was involved in relations with the native peoples of the Western part of Virginia. Uh, He was a, a man of extraordinary discipline. He never put something off till tomorrow that he could do for himself. The greatest gift he gave me, by far, was that he had a library of about 40 volumes, which was huge at the time. You know, most people had no books or one or two, maybe a Bible, maybe a Shakespeare. He had 40 volumes, and they were well chosen, and he put them at my disposal. His wish was that I would be classically educated, by, by which he meant fully, deeply educated. And this set the destinies of my life. Had he been Patrick Henry, and thank goodness he wasn't. Thank goodness I'm not related to Patrick Henry. But if he had been, I might not have become um, intellectually engaged. You know, when I was a young man, between the ages of, say, 12 and 20, I read 12, 15 hours per day. I knew, I learned seven languages, three ancient and four modern. I was, I was an indefatigable student. And partly because I wanted to fulfill my father's wish for me. And when a father dies at such a important time in the young man's life, we tend to idealize him forever. And I did. And I always wanted to behave in such a way that he would have honored, that he would have wanted to praise. That enabled me when I was 16 and just about 17 to go to the college, the College of William and Mary, of course. This is long before I created the University of Virginia. There I met the second most important man in my life, William Small, 
who was a figure of the British Enlightenment. And he then introduced me to books that my father would not have known, uh, John Locke and Montesquieu and Rousseau and Voltaire, the, the, the works of the, of the European Enlightenment. My father had one other extraordinary capacity. He married into the highest social strata of Virginia. I don't know quite how this happened. We, did, we didn't talk about such things in my life. My father married Jane Randolph, and, and as you know, the Randolphs were one of the two or three or four most prominent families in Virginia, and believe me, they understood that and made everybody else understand it too. So in a certain sense, he married up. He married into this upper echelon. Why she married him, I don't know. I guess she saw his character, because she certainly wouldn't have married him for his pedigree, but it worked. And so if you think of my life, sir, I'm in a way the beneficiary of this because by marrying her, he opened the door to me to the Tidewater aristocracy. And yet I favored my father's background and character and life more than the world of the Randolphs because not only were the Randolphs extremely self-satisfied, but as we all know, there was a streak of mental instability in that whole genetic line and it came very close to me when my daughter married Thomas Mann Randolph. So I was, my mother's a Randolph, my daughter marries a Randolph. You couldn't escape this family. Well, and I think you came up with a very interesting self-reflection that the Tidewater elite that you were uh, introduced to the through your father's uh, connection with your mother provided you opportunity. But... Uh, many of the things that grounded you in the fundamentals uh, of what became America in many ways came from your father. When you look at the American ideal, it is the self-made individual. It is the person who rises above their station in life for a whole host of reasons and fulfills their potential. Let me put it in another way, sir. It's a meritocracy. America at its finest is a meritocracy. My father was an average human being who was born in America. But by the quality of his character, by his discipline, by his hard work, by his desire to do the right thing always in life and to achieve things on behalf of the Commonwealth of Virginia, he became an important man. This is the ideal. And you know I wrote that famous letter to John Adams later in my life in which I distinguished pseudo-aristocracy from natural aristocracy. Pseudo-aristocracy is the Randolphs. These are the, and many other families too, of course, but these are the families that are born rich and born privileged and born central to the public business of the state. It doesn't have to do with merit. Sometimes it does. More often it doesn't. Those are pseudo-aristocrats. The natural aristocrats can be born in hovels or in wigwams. And we, as a society, need to find the natural aristocrats and lift them into positions of importance. And the pseudo-aristocrats are going to take care of themselves, as they always do. Some of them wind up being people of merit. But unless they are, we owe them nothing. Well, I think that's a fascinating way to look at it, and it's quintessential to the American ideals that were laid forth at the founding of the nation. Uh, so many individuals who while had resources, uh, built the lives that they wanted, invented themselves, and, and became the, the people that we needed to help form this nation. Um, I, I very much appreciate this portion of this conversation because I think that's a quintessential part of understanding who you are, Mr. President. But may I shift the focus just a little bit for the next few minutes to talk about one of the things that I think is one of your greatest uh, accomplishments, as do many others, the founding of what many consider to be the modern version of education and how that moved the colleges in the United States from the European tradition to a much more un-American version. Uh, do you believe you would have been able to found the University of Virginia had you not been President Thomas Jefferson, the, the author of the Declaration of Independence, the Secretary of State, the world traveler. It takes a lot to found uh, a great institution of higher knowledge. And uh, that's something I've always wondered. Had Jefferson, had Mr. President, had you been able to go down the path of 
the simple gentleman farmer, would we have seen the University of Virginia? Would we have seen what that represented in a modern American education for the time? The simple answer is no. I would not have been able to create the University of Virginia, which, as you know, was one of the three things for which I wish to be remembered in history. I barely was able to do it given my prestige. You know, I was a former president of the United States. I was the first secretary of state. I was a former governor of Virginia. And when I came to create the University of Virginia in my retirement, it took all of that accumulated prestige and more to get it done. And, and, and you must know it barely happened. The, the legislature didn't want to do this. Uh, the, they regarded this as the whim of a, of a philosopher who, at Botticello who was not always pragmatic. There were several times when it looked as if it just wasn't going to happen. And it took the fact that I was the author of the already most important document in the history of human liberty to get this over the mark. Well, and I'd like to talk about what was accomplished when the University of Virginia was established. As someone who has worked in education for the last few decades, I see the importance of providing opportunity, especially to first-generation college students, where, just like yourself, Mr. President, their families had not come from opportunity and not come from significant classical education or even perhaps much training and how the University of Virginia and the schools that were modeled on it after that really transformed life millions of times in thousands of institutions. But I see this as so central to the mission of your great institution. Could you speak to that? First of all, my critique of William and Mary, it's located in a terrible place. Uh, not only is it not central in Virginia, but it's a miasma of humidity. And, you know, in my time, we had no antibiotics. It was like, it was plaguey. You, you know, you, you took your life in your hands to be there during the summer months. That's number one. Number two, the architecture is deplorably bad. And I said once that, except that the buildings have roofs, you'd think that they're brick kilns. And third, it's just so smug. You know, it's so, it's so full of itself as an institution. And by the way, not very good education when I was there either. So I tried to reform it. They wouldn't be reformed. So then I chose a central place in Virginia, which, of course, coincidentally was near Monticello, but central to Virginia. And I had a completely different concept. So instead of training gentlemen's sons for whatever gentlemen's sons do in a state that pretends to be an aristocracy, I wanted to create an institution that would that would generate natural aristocrats, uh, and just as you were saying. So at the University of, of Virginia, the, the buildings are fabulous. Uh, the rotunda alone is a almost a perfect structure. Not, not, had nothing to do with me. It's it's a model of the Pantheon, and uh, when you when you see it, you're drawn to reason, not irrationality. You're drawn to reason and good sense. Uh, the curriculum was, was meant to be open, that there would be no requirements. Young people would come when they were ready. They'd study what they pleased, and they would leave when they felt full. That didn't last very long. Um, I was not allowed to have all of my uh, whims at the college, but it also is secular, sir. It, it, was, it was not the first institution in the United States, but certainly the first in Virginia that was 100% secular. There was a long and acrimonious debate about this, including in the House of Delegates, because many people thought that was blasphemous not to have chapels and so on. My solution was that there was a perimeter, and that was called the lawn or the campus. And outside of that perimeter, if the Baptists wanted to build a seminary, I was completely happy for them to do so, or the Methodists or the Lutherans or the Antibaptists and so on. This worked out. And I believe that the university should, any university, including yours, should pursue truth wherever it takes us, even if that takes us into some uh, dangerous zones, that we should follow truth, and the truth will prevail when left to itself. And every institution that is a church institution at some point butts up against the 
line of demarcation between faith and reason, and and that destroys the capacity for unlimited inquiry. And that was kind of exactly where I was hoping you might uh, go with that, because I think that's a, a crucial component to the success of the United States of America over the last several hundred years, that we have looked to imbue the average citizen with opportunity to provide pathways for success and to create an ecosystem that helps elevate. But, uh, you know, speaking of the University of Virginia and speaking of education, I would like you to speak a little more to some of the things that you had valued the most as you not only had your classical education, but then as you were designing the concept of the University of Virginia and what would be passed along to the students who came there. As you said, the idea was to have a more open curriculum. And in our time, education is evolving rapidly and we are struggling with what exactly should make up a degree. Could you speak to some of those things that you thought were so valuable for an American to know? Yes, of course. So one important distinction between my time and yours, we believed that what you call K through 12 was the essential arena of education because we wanted everyone to have that access. And we do it not because we want people to understand trigonometry or astronomy or physics. We do it because we want them to be citizens. And so it's really citizenship training, um, discernment of the truth, capacity to read texts, capacity to write in grammatical English, familiarity with with civics and with uh, civic engagement, virtue as it was understood back in the Roman Republic. That's the essential business of K through 12. I know you have veered from that. University life is not for everybody in my time. University life is for the the elite, and I don't mean the social elite, I mean the meritocrats, the, 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 the finest young minds of Virginia should wind up at William and Mary or Radford, or in my case, the University of Virginia. And so you have changed that idea that uh, the university is sort of a place for everybody. That's not how we saw it. So the reason I say this is not to uh, promote an an elite model of education, but to say the real business is K through 12, because the great majority of people are, are going to stop there. And if they don't have the wherewithal to be good citizens, at that point, we're doomed as a republic. A republic requires a very high level of civic engagement and and understanding of what's at stake. A university teaches you belles lettres, philosophy, political theory, astronomy, uh, calculus, geology, what we call ethnology, what you call anthropology. Those are things that not every citizen needs. To be a complete human being... You need that, if you can get it. To be a good citizen, you don't necessarily need that. And so that model has completely been shattered, except at a few very elite institutions in your time. And therefore, you might wish to rethink higher education to a certain degree. And I think that it's simply the case that the great majority of Virginians in my time were not interested in reading Chaucer. It might have made them better human beings. I dare say it would. But life compels us to engage in some pretty basic economic functions. You know, we, we, we work, we feed our family, we, we, we shelter ourselves, we bear children, we make sure those children have, have the tools to thrive in the world. And so that's a, a really important, I think, distinction Uh, in the way that education has been configured in my time or in yours. But we need both. We we absolutely need both. Mr. President, thank you so much for sitting down with us today as we have reflected on some of the pieces that influenced your early life on your family history and how living the life that you live ultimately resulted in so many things that impact us even today here in the 21st century. We do need to take a short break, and we so very much appreciate your willingness to speak with us. We're listening to America with Clay Jenkinson, and when we return, Mr. Jenkinson will join us.
Welcome back to the special edition of Listening to America. My friend David Horton is sitting across from me virtually at Radford University, unthinkable in Jefferson's time. How many students at Radford? You know, we've got about 8,000 when you consider all the way students study. Uh, there are students at a remote campus in Roanoke, just down the road from us, that are studying medical sciences and some levels of nursing. We have students online, and then we have physically around 5,200 students right here on the Radford campus. And as a model, are you more William & Mary or more UVA? I think definitely more UVA. When, when I asked Mr. Jefferson those questions, it was definitely to get at how the university of Virginia transformed the concept of education and the state system, which Radford University is a part of, definitely has pursued that. But to Mr. Jefferson's point, K-12 education is absolutely crucial and Radford began as a teacher training institution. The goal was to create more teachers, better quality K-12 education, and more opportunity in the entire commonwealth, but definitely in the southwestern portion, and that's why an institution was founded at Radford. Many things to talk about here, my friend. Number one, the failure of K-12 through education in America, and I'm not uh, like a sloppy critic of, of education. I know that these institutions work very hard, and the teachers are, on the whole, deeply dedicated to their work and so on. So I, I know it's easy to kind of beat up on public education. I'm not, I'm not wanting to do that, but its failure, in my opinion, is that it's not creating citizens. And we see it in the last six or seven years in our national life where people really don't even know what's at stake. They don't know the difference between the popular vote and the electoral college, and they resent that there even is an electoral college. They don't know whether executive orders are founded in the Constitution or not. And so we're in deep trouble. Our republic is disintegrating. And I think the main reason is that we don't any longer train the young people of this country to understand what is at stake in a republic. So I think you agree with that. I struggle with it. You know, we have a wonderful school system here in the city of Radford, Radford City Public Schools, and they do an incredible job, but we ask them to do way too much. Schools are not only places to provide education, they are babysitters, they are conduits for food, they are conduits for mental health, they're conduits for physical health. As a society, we have defaulted to having our schools become the end-all, be-all for children from the age of four or five up until the age of 18 in terms of the services that are provided. And I think revisiting that would allow the schools to get more to the mission you describe. Having said that, I think there is going to have to be a reckoning at some point and a national conversation about what we want to be the outcome for education. People have to be able to evolve and grow, and having a robust, diverse toolbox is becoming more and more critical. How we get everyone to that place is, is the big question. I would ask you this, as a scholar, you know, what do you see as some of the opportunity for K-12 education, as well as some of the challenges? I think a lot about this. Um, I'm not involved in K-12. through My mother was a teacher. My sister was a teacher. My father trained to be a teacher. He wasn't one. And I have great respect for the public school teachers and private, of course, of this country. I think you have to look at it from the output. You know, in other words, uh, someone starting K through 12 today is going to be a complete adult around what 2050. Uh, what do we want them to know? You're using the word toolkit. What What are the tools that they need? Uh, we don't even know what that world's going to look like. And I don't think that when 2050 comes, that our university and K through 12 systems are going to look anything like what they look like today. Uh, I think that we're in a revolution here. So what do we want them to know? A, they need to be flexible. B, they need to have great critical thinking skills, discernment skills. They need to have tools that will enable them to use the systems we have. So when I was in high school, we had we took a typing course. The skills people need today are, are so different. I mean, they need to be able to handle a smartphone. They need to be able to pay their bills electronically. They need to be able to look something up, say, about the Holocaust or about Thomas Jefferson and slavery, be able to decide whether it's reliable or unreliable. An understanding that the world is just going to be a breathtakingly different place every two years of their lives and that it's not enough to know the history of the Civil War. In a sense, that's not going to help them through life. And so I start that way. You know, what's the toolbox that we want people to have? And I think people are thinking about this, of course, but I think it's going to be difficult. So we've, we've got to adjust, right? 
And we've got to find a way to do it that is not a conservative answer or a liberal answer or a Republican and Democrat answer, because if we have those barriers of party line in place, we'll never get there. And, and that's one of the biggest challenges that I see uh, moving forward. But you hit the nail on the head with critical thinking. If I had to say one thing, that has to be imbued really from the earliest levels of education all the way through, because that is truly becoming more and more crucial. We talked about artificial intelligence. We talked about deep fakes and videos and audio that will be very, very apparent that it is true and it's not. Also, the other piece is how we meet the needs of our citizenry with a K-12 education all the way through whatever degree someone might achieve whatever training. But the deep politicization of this is going to be crucial. And and I think that's a hard part because so many people see opportunity and advantage to taking a political approach to education. I think you're absolutely right. I think that we need to move sort of in the sense of the German model and, and make practical training more legitimate and have less of a kind of a, an attitude about that. I think welding is really important. And Landscaping is really important, and we need to we need to restore the idea of the dignity of work. You don't have to be able to read biographies of J. Robert Oppenheimer or understand a little quantum mechanics to be a complete human being in our time. I think that's really essential, and I think we've been kind of moving down the wrong path on that. At the same time, I'm really worried about what's called workforce training. I, I don't believe in workforce training as a model for higher ed. Yes, of course, that has to be a factor. But what Jefferson said really deeply moves me, and I think it moves you too, that to be a complete human being, it's not just preparing for a life in the economy. To be a complete human being, you need to be able to read great texts. You need to be able to discern beautiful music. You need to be able to uh, to see beyond the limits of, of, a, of a narrow economic paradigm about life. You need to be able to know something about how we got to where we are. And I think that that's not for everybody, but everybody should have a chance to have some of that. And if you start to eliminate that as as is happening, I, I mean, I know a prominent candidate for the presidency on the Republican side who said recently on a talk show, four-year education was a mistake. It's a German concept from a couple of hundred years ago. We don't need that anymore. I could not disagree more profoundly with that. At the same time, we need certification and two-year schools and, and training schools, community colleges. I want to get back to Jefferson for just a minute here, my friend. You brought up his life, and we talked a lot about his father. We did not mention his mother, the Randolph, and he didn't really talk about her either. And that has led some biographers to say that, well, he didn't like her or whatever. I don't think that's true at all. I think that his mother was a Randolph, and he said at one point she traces her lineage well back into British aristocracy to, to let everyone give what credit they want to that. And that, it's a little snarky, but the, I, I think he's an anti-aristocrat. So he's this amazing figure, David. He's an aristocrat as Democrat. You know, of all the founding fathers, and I say this again, of all the founding fathers, Jefferson is the one and only one who really believed that average human beings are up to it. Absolutely. And that's kind of what I wanted to get to with today's discussion as we went through was how much his father represented that American ideal that he he discussed so often in, in all of the things that he did. You even see that with the founding of the University of Virginia. So there was a method to this madness a little bit today. And I would even say, um, you know, part of the struggle he had in perhaps describing his mother or sharing, part of that was his uh, reluctance to showcase so much of his personal life. Uh, of course, at the time, men talked about their fathers far more than their mothers because that would be the guiding force in their lives in some ways. But I think Jefferson is the perfect mix of both. And it is crucial that we talk about both because the opportunity, the literature, the music, all of the pieces that enriched his life really came from his mother's side. One of my theories has always been that the person Jefferson professed to wanting to be would never have been possible for him. And I, I would love to talk about that. I think he just my perception is he would have been restless as a farmer, even though he may have enjoyed those things, there were so many other pieces to him that he wanted to 
explore and, and paths he wanted to go down. Can you speak to that a little bit about how it was maybe inevitable that Jefferson became the person he was? Absolutely. I think that's a very shrewd insight, uh, David. He wrote that letter that I think is really a central and critical letter about Dabney Carr, that he was content with bacon and some stick furniture, you know, in a modest house. And Jefferson, I think, sees that as a possibility, but he knows it's not him. And why isn't it Jefferson? It's partly his parents, of course, but it's also something else that happened. I mean, he's America's da Vinci. So most Virginians learned a little Latin, Virginia white gentlemen, and they used it as you know tags in their correspondence or cocktail parties. Jefferson goes deep and reads all of Latin literature. Uh, Jefferson's always doing what others are doing as sort of a finishing school to actually master things. You know, so mastery is the word you have to use with Jefferson. Mastery. Everything he touched, he t- attempted to master. It's hard to know where that came from, but I do think the combination of a sort of self-made father and an aristocratic mother, and also living well away from the tidewater, but having access to the tidewater, I think is the key to, for what we know of the formation of Thomas Jefferson. But, you know, he's maybe just a black swan. From time to time, the world creates a genius. There's an aloofness in Jefferson. He lives on a mountain. He, he's always trying to withdraw. And he lived beyond his means. And, and, of course, it was all held up by enslaved people that we must never forget even for a moment here. So he's an odd and interesting member of the founding generation. But in terms of what you do, as a sort of the philosopher of a society where average people through merit can achieve greatness, nobody can match Jefferson in that, not even someone later like Abraham Lincoln. I know we're almost out of time, David. I'm interested in what you think about the, the recent national conversation about uh, legacy uh, in education. You know, if we, if we took the legacy people away from Harvard and Yale, what would be left? If you took legacy from UVA, I don't think that's so true in Radford, although I'm sure you have some of that. We do. We do. I think every institution does. You know, it is a mixed bag and how you provide opportunity is what it comes down to. I think the biggest challenge that you run into is legacy provides continuity, legacy provides resources, legacy provides influence, and all of those things are important in maintaining an institution of any sort. But I think also it has to be balanced. And and I'll go back to this. And and I give UVA a little more credit than, than perhaps others might. It is still very much an institution of the people. While there is an elite element, of course, I do believe that it transforms lives. Now, I, I come from a very different place in, in many ways, uh, a place like Radford University here. Our core mission is in that transformation. Many of the the students who go to the University of Virginia would be successful regardless of what higher education pursuit they had. Uh, Not that they don't work hard. I have some incredibly wonderful friends who have attended the university and they're brilliant. They're so much smarter than I am. But I was that person who truly benefited from the Socratic method, from that teacher-student relationship. And that's what a school like Radford does so well and so many do so well. And That is one of the threads. One of the whole pieces of this discussion was to pull these little threads of Jefferson's life and how it was almost inevitable that he went down the path that he did, that it would have likely been impossible for so many things to happen for him, for the what became the Commonwealth, what became the, the United States of America, and what became the modern world. There's so many things that happen in our lives that we don't anticipate, that we don't necessarily invite, but that inform the things that we become. And perhaps it was inevitable in our origin story that those things happened to form the person, the the persona, the outcomes that our lives generate. All of that ties together. Yeah. So just a couple of things I know we're really short on time now, David, but number one, the importance of mentors. So Jefferson's encounter with William Small was as important as his birth and his parents, including his father. Uh, It's so important to keep the mentorship model alive, and it's it's dangerous now because of sexual predation and the perception that uh, we're moving into an electronic universe in education and so on. But the actual relationship between an older knowledgeable person and a younger impressionable person in a in a true trust relationship is essential to the future of education it was central to my education i'm sure it was to yours 
and 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 we must never forget that and 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 just because you know there is sexual predation in the catholic church doesn't mean we end the priesthood and just because there's sexual predation in the professor student uh, relationship we mustn't turn away from that second thing the most moving thing i heard today was when you talked at the beginning about transformation i think that's the the key to it you know so i think of a young person going off to radford or the university of virginia or yale unfinished and confused and kind of carrying the family um baggage and then coming back for that first thanksgiving and shocking everyone by quoting marx or denouncing the pilgrims or whatever you know but because that's that's so important that you, you, we don't want the same person to come out of college who went in we don't want to strip them of their values and we don't want to proselytize or indoctrinate but we do want them to undergo a very serious transformation i'll give you a quick example my daughter went to columbia at first she was a she had a roommate who was a jewish woman from new york and she became a zionist and at christmas i said Okay, uh, I'd be interested to see how that works out. Then she took a course from a famous Palestinian historian, and she became a, an anti-Zionist. And I, I love both of them because it meant that she was processing the complexity of the world, and there's no simple answer. And anytime you take one paradigm, you know you're mistaking. And so when people like Rick Santorum and other conservatives say, we mustn't let the universities teach our children to hate America, they're speaking nonsense. I'm sure this happens in a handful of cases, but on the whole, that transformation is the very essence of what education should be. And I don't have any preferred outcome. If they come out b becoming libertarians of the Ayn Rand sort, I have no quarrel with that, but I don't want them to be the same person coming out that they were coming in because nobody is ready at 18 to understand the world. I think you're exactly right. And so much of it is about a process of evolving to become the best version of who we are and we don't want to limit that to a an expected outcome in many ways because it limits our possibilities and we don't have that margin for error. We need people to be all of those diverse, different things to provide the rich tapestry that allows our society co to continue to grow. One last thing. You mentioned robots. I can only be bitter about that because you still owe me a robot from like 10, 10 years ago now. And we've gotten tremendous response to our program on artificial intelligence. And I do think that, you know, things I said five years ago to students, we need to flip the classroom and that, you know, there's nothing that's not in the smartphone that a professor really can teach you. Those things seem like antiquated now because things are changing so fast. And it's hard to know what higher education can possibly look like. Even 10 years from now, uh, we are certainly going to move into a more virtual model. The campus with its volleyball courts and its gymnasium and its food court and so on is it will hang on there'll still be a lot of that and i think it's essential that there be a residential capacity quality of residential life for universities and colleges but we can't count on that being the only paradigm hereafter and so buckle up my friend you're exactly right and i'll go back to jefferson's model of the university of virginia he wanted to house the students and faculty together on the range on the lawn for the, so that the happy accidents took place, the happy discussions, the serendipity of education, of you just happen to bump into each other and you had the best discussion of your life that altered your course forever. And that's what can happen at a higher institution. An that's what can happen at a college or university that we don't want to lose. We want to keep those opportunities at present. Thank you so much for this conversation today. It has been enlightening for me, hopefully enlightening for all our listeners out there and all the people that are listening to America. Thank you, my friend. We'll see you next week for another important edition of Listening to America with Clay Jenkins.